Good morning. Praise the Lord. How many of you would rather be here today than in jail? Well, that's only right there. Yeah, pray for them. Hallelujah. Well, we're excited about being here today. And I always bring, of course, when I can, my better half. I thought about that when you mentioned, you know, a couple of times last night and tonight. This is the first uh, first church I've been to in the U.S., I think, in um, three years and so the reason is, is we do, of course, we've had the privilege and opportunity to do a lot of conferences, both in the U.S. as well as, uh, obviously, other parts of the world that we've been to. So, but, you know, the, I really believe, honestly, God's heart is with the local church because it's that local church that God raises up. And the reason I want to bring that to you is that if you don't have a home church and you're here today, then I want to strongly uh, encourage you to consider either here Life of Faith here or Life of Faith, where, where's it? North, Life of Faith North. And just really, and I'll, I'll tell you when I get, maybe as I start here a little bit later, why I think that's true, what, what God is really doing. In fact, so I don't forget it, I'll just tell you now. You know, uh, there, there are new things happening. So, some of you, many of you that are in here today are very familiar with Andrew Walmack and Andrew Walmack Ministries and Karis Bible College, but you know back in 1980, not a lot of people had heard of Andrew Walmack. Now, some of you may have, uh, but it wasn't really until the year 2000, and I'm telling you that for a reason. There has really been different shifts that have happened in the body of Christ, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. And, what, and if you talk to Andrew, like I have, of course, the opportunity to do as CEO, I, we talk basically every day, either email, text, or in some form we're communicating. And, you know, one of the things that he, he will say about his own ministry and his own life is that it's just, it's, it's just my time. Well, what happened was society shifted, and I'm telling you this for a reason, and I teach this in the business school at Karis. Society shifted, and what happened was Back in the 1970s, 1980s, and of course 60s, there was a real move of God. We call it the charismatic movement. People were getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we really had a strong word of faith movement that was happening, and many of us, of course, came through that, even those that are here this morning. But what's happened is, is that then as, as things change in life and in society, then the move of God, what God wants to see to uh, really minister to us and meet where we are, then churches shift with that. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is that Andrew, for example, right now is his time. And today that ministry is growing. Of course, I'm the CEO. And, and uh, the reason I'm telling you that is we have 650 employees just in the U.S., primarily in the Woodland Park campus alone. And it's a pretty complex organization, about 800 employees worldwide. And last year, the ministry uh, exceeded $81 million in annual revenues. And I didn't say this last night, but we have those I did, but this is new. We have over, if I have any accountants or attorneys in here, we have over $120 million in booked assets, not just appraised assets, but booked assets that we have in the ministry. And Andrew looked at me about three months ago and he said, I want to build another $600 million on this property. He said, can you raise somebody up to take care of it? Now that's almost, are you ready? That's right at three quarters of a billion dollars. I think sometimes we think too small. Yeah. Now the reason I'm sharing that is here it is. Here's the punchline. Not about us or what we're doing, but what's happening is I believe Pastor Mark and Jennifer, what I've, when I've been talking to them, God raises up pastors in every new season. Now watch this, not just new seasons for this particular church, that's certainly true, but there's also new seasons for the church in general, both in the nation and in the world. 
and you ha and there's certain understandings, or if you want me to talk more in biblical terms, there's certain revelations that the Holy Spirit brings and unveils uh, in the life. And this church right now, from the few conversations that I've had since I've been here, this church right now, I'm hearing a sound. Not everybody hears the sound. It's like a dog whistle, but it's in the spirit. And I hear a sound. Wherever I go in the world, and I go a lot until COVID happened, I'm somewhere internationally typically once a month. And there's a sound that is blowing, and this church is blowing that sound sound. And the reason I'm telling you, the reason I'm telling you that if you're a guest or visitor here today, I'm telling you this church is blowing that sound. So you need to connect to that. Now, if you have a home church, then I commend you, support your home church and where you are. But if you don't, I just want to encourage you. And I wouldn't say this, believe me, believe me, I wouldn't say this if it wasn't true. I'd go ahead and preach and be nice, but, uh, or, or at least, at least for the most part, I'd be nice, but you know, but uh, but the truth is, I just want to encourage you because I really felt the Lord tell me that on the front row, and I've taken a little more time with that. But I just want to encourage you with that, and that's a big deal. Becky and I were actually talking about it this morning at coffee. Now, we were talking about you, and we have coffee. The first part of it started off a little rough. She said she wasn't. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's a joke. Settle down over here. Y'all settle down. But, um, but the truth is, really, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about what you guys are doing, and I'm excited about what I sense that I've been here. So I just want to encourage you with that. Now, me and, me and Miss Becky here, we've been married for 46 years. And, uh, and, uh, and he's just about where I want him. Yeah, it's just, just about. Well, you know, when we first started off, I started saluting with one hand. Then after we had our kids, I started saluting with both hands. Now that we where we're at in life, now I salute both hands oh. and a foot. I but, how you're do that. but we've been married 46 years. I'm only 39 years old, but we've been married 46 years. And uh, when, when she can, she goes with me. She really wanted to come on this trip. She doesn't go on all the international ones, about half the internationals. So say hello. <laughs> He's such a man of few words. <laughs> Praise God. No, it is so great to be here. He's right. I could not hardly wait to get here. Uh, I know when they came in, and, and uh, Bill has two EAs. He has one in Denver, and he has one in Woodland Park, and they work together on his schedule. <laughs> so he has takes two to schedule this man. Praise God. And when I heard that he was coming, I'm like, where am I in this picture? He goes, oh, you want to come? I said, did you ask? <laughs> yes, I want to come. Praise God. I knew when I got here what I was going to get because I have met your pastors. And there's always a good sense there. I came from a uh, South Texas family, very close family. We did everything together. We lived by each other. We cooked, they raised the kids, and Bill will tell you that because when he came in, he had to have the family approval. Not just the immediate family, but the whole family approval. When Bill and I got married, uh, I tell this at Wealth Builders, so if you've heard it before, I apologize, but it is who I am and why I'm here. The Lord told me, he said that I knew, I love this man. Oh. But there was more that came with him. I knew that. And so I knew that we weren't going to be able to stay where we were. He told me that from the beginning. And so I knew if I accepted his uh, proposal, what that meant. And that meant leaving my family. So I really had to pray about that because I was not only a daddy's girl, I was a family person. Very, very close. We all lived in the same county. And if you left, you were a black sheep. <laughs> There was a reason you left. But anyway, <laughs> you know the family thing. Come on now. But anyway, so I, had, I went and spent some time in prayer, and I, I just poured my heart out and said, Lord, do you know what you're asking me to do? Do you know what you're asking me? And he very sweetly said, yes, I do. And if you will obey it, I will give you a family all over the world. And I said, then that works for me. So I told him last night I needed some Bama people. 
So I knew when I got here, I was going to get some people that knew how to talk to me and I could talk to you. And there's nothing like a Southern family. Praise God. So thank you for allowing me to come. One more quick thing. My scripture is this, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad. If that becomes your scripture, I'm telling you everything will change because every day is the day. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, you, how many of you can tell I'm married up? <laughs> so what I did was I married up and I married money. Her dad. Yeah, it wasn't his money. That's the first thing my dad said. He said, I love you, boy, but it's not your money. Yeah. So he told me it wasn't his money and I still hadn't got it. So. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we had a great time last night. And uh, I really appreciate, uh, I, felt, I felt at home being here. And I certainly appreciate that. So, Pastor Mark, thank you, and Jennifer. And what I want to say as we talk about that, let's give our pastors a big hand today. Because they're, come on, let's join them. Because... Because uh, they're the ones that actually, I call it being in the trenches every day with you. And, you know, I have, I have one, seriously, I have one of the best jobs in the world. I used to kid, excuse me, I used to kid people, you know, that I'd like to have a job, you know, where I, where I made a lot of money, only had to work one day a month, you know. And I'd tell the pastors, I told them this morning, it can't be on Sunday, though. And I don't want to have to preach. So I just want to show up. You know, how many of you know you'd like to have a job like that? I think I've got it now. So, uh, except I have to work a little more than one day a month. But anyway. Well, this morning I want to share some things with you. And I'm just going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit today. Last night, of course, we had our PowerPoint. I didn't use it a lot. I used the whiteboard more. Uh, but uh, today I want to talk to you for a few minutes as we get started about the favor of God and the favor of God in your life. And I want to read from Jeremiah chapter 52 and verse uh, 31. And let me set my timer. That's what I'm doing here. Now, usually I don't go more than two hours. Should we take a vote or how are we going to do this? But uh, <clears throat> Thank you, my friend. For that. Um, and so today I'm going to read a scripture to you that some of you may have never read in your entire life. Now if you do yearly go through your Bible once a year, you know, read through the Bible a year, every year then probably you've read this but you may not have known you read it. So <clears throat> I was reading this one day in my devotions um, and I came across this passage in Jeremiah chapter 52. In verse 31, I'm going to start with it, and I'm going to read it in the Amplified Classic Bible. And it says, in the 37th year of the captivity of Joach, and I'm in verse 31 of Jeremiah 52. Uh, and in the 37th year of the captivity of Joach, and also called Conaniah and Jeconiah, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Joachim, king of Judah, and showed favor. Everybody just say that out loud, favor. And showed favor to him and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were captives with him in Babylon. And Joachim put off his prison garments and he dined regularly at the king's table all the days of his life. And then this part is my, really my favorite part of this verse. It says in our passage, it says, And his allowance, a continual one, was given him by the king of Babylon, a portion according to his requirements until the day of his death, all the days of his life. Now, 
when, when I read this, of course, today because of iPads and other kinds of, you know, computers and iPhones and all that, you can carry your Bible with you, right, on, on, uh, on an electronic device. And in doing so, you can check a lot of translations really quick, right? It's a powerful tool. I used to have to study where I'd get all the big books off the shelf and your whole desk would be covered and you're trying to study different translations or dictionaries. Today, you can just do it, you know, hit your screen a couple of times and you're there. Now, the reason I said that is because what stood out to me, and this is, I went immediately over to the Amplified Classic Bible, it, what stood out to me, it says, in the 37th year of the captivity of Joachim. Now, let me just say this to you. That's a long time to be in captivity. That's a long time to be a prisoner, 37 years. So Joachim was actually in the prison for 37 years. And, and I want you to get this. And the Bible says that the king reached down and lifted up the head of Joachim and showed favor to him. And it says here, he did it. What's this? Verse 32 says, he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were captives with him in Babylon. So there's this whole group of kings, right, that have been captured. Typically, they're like what we would think of today as mayors of a larger city or something like that, except they literally were kings, so they owned and had everything. But it was about, so all these kings, all these leaders of cities and small territories were here. And all of a sudden, Joachim had been in there 37 years. And all of a sudden, the king reached down and picked him up and set him above the other kings after 37 years. And so as I was looking at that, that just stood out to me as I was doing my devotions and reading this and as I began to meditate in it, and I began to look at that, I thought to myself as I was doing that, wow, 37 years is a really, really long time. 37 years, right? You remember Jesus came to the man down uh, by the porch, we call them the porches, or the pool of Siloam, and, and he saw him, and, and the Bible says that he had actually been ill, I think it's right, 37 or 38 years. He had actually been in that condition, actually it says a long time. He'd been in that condition a long time. And Jesus asked him a really unusual question. He asked him the question, he said, now, if, you, if you're ill and you're lame and you're on your bed and you can't walk and you've been that way a long time, right? John chapter 5 is where it is. You've been that way a long time. Jesus looked at the man and asked him a really unusual question. He said, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? Now, that's an unusual question to ask somebody that's been, been ill, been on their bed for 37 or 38 years. Do you want to be made well? Well, you know, one of the reasons why that happened is, uh, I believe happens, is because we become comfortable and familiar with our circumstances or our environment, and we kind of just accept where we are, and sometimes... Even the miracle working power of God or the power of the word of God to set us free, it comes to us in a way that actually stirs up our life and moves us from being, watch this now, in that which is comfortable and familiar, God will take us out of that which is comfortable and familiar. And if you don't think what I'm telling you is the truth, right? You don't think comfortable and familiar? If you don't think what I'm telling you is the truth and we resist it, Right? We resist it. Even getting healed. Even being blessed. If you don't think that's true, try to go on a diet. <laughs> right? And everything in you screams out. I know I had it happen last night. Pastor Mark is over there dipping his sausage in that good cream gravy at Cracker Barrel. And I heard the gravy calling out to me, Billy, come and partake, come and partake. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that wasn't the voice of the Holy Spirit. That was the voice of my flesh. 
Can I get some help in here? Come on. So 37 years is a long time. And just because you feel uncomfortable sometimes, well, let me tell you, anytime you're going to move forward in God and God has you going into territory you hadn't gone in before, sometimes things are going to seem unfamiliar and sometimes they're going to feel a little uncomfortable and some of us are going to think it's the voice of the Holy Spirit telling us not to move forward when most of the time it's your stinking flesh. Thank you, Billy. That's really good preaching. I'm going to try the choir here for a second, see if I can get some help. Hey, wasn't that great praise and worship? Man, you guys did awesome. And, and, uh, and the leaders that you, seriously, that was great praise and worship. I, I mean, it was awesome. So sometimes you need to lead worship maybe in, in Karis or something. I like that. That was pretty good. Man, Seth, that was awesome, man. You've done that, huh? You know. These guys, they, they were good. I tell you now, I like the blood song. Where's the one that led that? The blood, the guy? Where's he at? Eh? Where's Derek at? Hey, man, you did awesome. I felt it. Then the young lady on this side, man, what's her name? Yeah. Hannah. Man, I felt that the anointing. That was awesome worship. So I just want to commend you guys. What was I talking about, Rachel? You remember? <laughs> Unfamiliar and comfortable. Yeah. So, so, so think about this. Joachim was in this situation for 37 years. So I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, now here's all the other kings. They've all been in captivity in Babylon a long time. Joachim specifically was in there for 37 years. How come all of a sudden one day, you reached down and picked him up. And the Lord began to show me in the scripture, and I went and did a word study on names in the passage. And the name Joachim, are you ready for this? Literally means preparation. And the Holy Spirit said to me as I was reading that, Joachim was preparing for 37 years for the moment that I reached down and picked him up and lifted him out. In other words, let me say it this way. Joachim was properly stewarding for 37 years the season he was in. See, sometimes we think that we're stuck. Sometimes we think the heavens are brass. Sometimes we think God's not paying any attention. Sometimes we don't think we're ever going to have a breakthrough. Sometimes we think it's never going to happen for us. But if we'll stay faithful to the word and we'll use the season we're in as a season of stewardship, which is proven out by a season of preparation when that time and moment comes when God begins to re reach down, pick us up, lift us above the other kings, watch this now and put new clothes on us and lets us dine regularly or daily <coughs> at his table and gives us an allowance a daily one, we're ready for it because in the midst when we think everything is not happening in our life in the way we thought it ought to happen, all of a sudden God reaches down and picks us up and and feeling uncomfortable or unfamiliar won't keep us from walking into the destiny that God has already declared over your life. <clears throat> Listen today, you're not stuck. I declare that over you and you're not limited. But if you'll understand the season that you're in, God shows up. You steward that season. You honor God in that season. Even if you've been in that season for 37 years of captivity, God is God and he doesn't forget and he's paying attention and if you steward that season he'll reach down and pick you up and set you above the other king I remember when I came around Andrew Womack and I started teaching in Karis Business School in 2011 and I can promise you, I don't mean this to come across wrong in any way, but I can promise you I didn't need a job. As a matter of fact, let me just be real candid. I didn't want a job. <laughs> right? I retired, what now, 16, 17 years ago. And I played golf for two years and 
I had my swimming pool down there in Houston with a big waterfall and all that stuff you have and sit in my house and I didn't want anybody to bother me. I had another home in Keystone, Colorado and we go back and forth. When it got too hot in Houston, I'd go to Colorado. Got too cold in Colorado, I'd go back to Houston. I was living the dream until the Holy Ghost started stirring my life in the form of my wife. <laughs> and she walked in one day. I told them this last night. She walked in, looked at me, and pointed me right in the face one morning. I know we always had, we, for years, we've always had coffee together. We hardly ever miss it unless I'm out of the country and she's not with me. We have coffee every morning. We pray together every morning. Sometimes I, here I'll teach you on the seven things we pray every morning. And we prayed those, and we pray. And that morning, instead of us starting praying and praying the seven things, she looked at me and said, if you don't get off this couch, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound real spiritual, but I heard it. Yeah, I know it's the same thing is true in Alabama, but in South Texas, those girls know how to shoot. <laughs> and God began to stir my nest and got me up. Began to see me get some things, and I began to obey God, began to do, began to obey God, do what God was saying. And all of a sudden, this is a true story. And I, ha I didn't tell this last night, and I'm talking about Joachim here in the season of preparation. And this is a true story, absolutely true story. She told me that. And I began to hear what she was saying. It's time to get up. I own some uh, hair franchise, uh, franchise, uh, franchises uh, that we were running in that area. I, I wasn't personally running them, but somebody else did. I owned them. And then, of course, I owned a lot of real estate. So in those days, a lot more even than I own now. I own a lot of real estate. And so those, the folk out there I had working were doing it. But she told me, if you don't get off the couch, I'm going to kill you. Now, she was serious. And I got serious. And so I got off the couch, meaning I literally stood up that morning and said, yes, ma'am, I'm getting off the couch. And so what happened was about, I'm talking about the seasons of life, about uh, uh, within less than 30 days, a friend of mine who I mentioned last night, by the name of Lance Wallnow, who, who, of course, teaches on the Seven Mountains, he called me, and he said, just out of the blue, I mean, totally out of the blue, he called me and said, hey, Billy, I'm doing a dream trip. I think this one is in Mazalan, Mexico or somewhere. I want you to come do the, I want you to come teach on finances and money. And I said, Lance, I'm not doing that right now. And he said, yes, you are. I want you to come. And within a day or two of Lance calling me, Paul Milligan called me and said, hey, we're starting a business school at Karis. And he said, I want you to come help me start the school. And I remember I saw the phone ring because Lance had already called me and it said, Paul Milligan, you know, in this day and age, you can hit decline. And so I look, you know, used to just used to say calling, right? And so I, I looked at that and I hit the, and I was going to hit the client and my wife just slapped me. We we're in a pickup truck, my pickup truck. I like to drive pickups, you know, I was in my pickup truck and, and uh, we were going to Goodwill and we were delivering, giving some stuff, a bunch of stuff away to Goodwill. And she said, you answer that phone, Rachel. Now she, she's as bad sometimes a good EA, you know, she'll slap me upside the head. And so she slapped me. She said, you answer the phone. And so I finally picked up the phone, said, who is this? That's what I did. I knew it was Paul because I was reading the name. And he said, uh, Billy, this is Paul. I said, man, what you doing? He said, uh, no, that's how he talks if you've ever on the phone. Yeah. Billy, this is Paul. I said, what? What's going on? He said, man, Andrew's approved starting a school, a business school. He said, I want you to come help me start it. I said, man, Paul, I don't know if I can do that right now. My wife hit me again. Bam. She said, you tell him you're coming whenever he needs you. It's a true story. It's a true story, I promise. <laughs> and so God stirred my nest. And of course today, I've got a nice small-time, part-time job that is <laughs> called the CEO of Andrew Walmart Ministry and Karis Bible College. But the reason I share that with you is that sometimes we despise the season of preparation. And we despise not and don't see sometimes what God is really doing in that season. So I want to give you a couple of things. I'm not going to have time to share all this today. But I just want to give you a couple of really quick ones. Number one, you can write this down. Favor is attracted to a spirit of preparation. 
Now, last night I read, tonight, or this morning, I'm sorry, I'm going to read a couple of extra verses than what I read last night, but I want to read Matthew chapter 25 and verse 15, and then I'm going to skip down to Matthew 25 verse 24, and I'm going to, but for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and read it in the translation I want to read it in. And uh, the translation I want to read it in is in the Message Bible out of Matthew chapter 25 on the subject of the parable of the talents. And remember this, the statement, favor is attracted to a spirit of preparation. The Bible says in Matthew 25 and verse 15, in verse 15, it said to one, he gave 5,000, and here, this is in the Message Bible, he gave $5,000 to another 2,000, and to a third one, 1,000, and uh, I referenced this last night, didn't read it, it says here, depending on their abilities, then he left. And one of the statements I said last night was this, is you remember, now stay with me here, you remember that the, the best things in your life that come to you, and I mean the God things, they are attracted, not just pursued. In fact, let me say it to you another way. Money in your life, money is attracted, not pursued. The minute you start pursuing money, Money, watch this now, the minute you start pursuing it, and you, you can be broke and pursue money. The minute you start pursuing it for the sake of money, what will happen is, watch this now, what will happen is the love of money will take over your life. And the Bible says the love of money is the root of some evil. It says it's the love, what? Not money, but the love of money is the root of, that's because you'll do anything to get it. So as you begin, notice it says that when the master came, he allotted the talents, not out of his sovereignty, not because he just chose it that way, but he allotted the talents, the Bible says, I'm reading right out of the Bible, said depending on their abilities. So somewhere along the line, the guy with the five talents or here, $5,000, he had evidently been in some kind of season of preparation and shown things because he got five. The one with two evidently had been in some season and he got two. The one with one probably wasn't in a lot of season because he only got one. He hadn't been in a lot of preparation season. He only got one. And the Bible says right here that he gave each one according to his ability. So the one with five took it and turned it into five more. The one with two took it and turned it into two more. And the master said, well done. When he came to the one with the one, the one with the one said, Lord, I wanted your money to be secure, right? So I dug a hole and I planted, that sounds like some Christians. Let me just say it this way and be real, real candid. Sometimes we value security a whole lot more than we do freedom. I'm saying something. And right now, what's happening in America and the sea change the devil wants to see happen is he wants to see, the devil wants to see communism, Marxism, and socialism come into this country, you'll feel secure because you can get your bowl of soup, but you will not be free and you'll never prosper financially because there's no opportunity in that system to do that. And the reason I share that with you and the reason I challenge you with that is because you, you and I have to understand that God, thank God for God, amen? Thank God for God, that God gives us the ability. We don't have to play it safe. In fact, <laughs> verse, verse 28 and 29 said about the one who dug the hole and put it in the ground. Verse 28 and 29 in the Message Bible says, take the thousand or the one talent and give it to the one who risked the most. Now here, I didn't have a chance because, you know, the, the time gets away anytime you're speaking. But, but, but one of the things I want to tell you about this is the one who took the five and turned it into five more now had ten. Got it? However, at the very end of this parable here that we look at, Jesus said, take the one away from the one who dug the hole. Now that doesn't seem fair. 
He's only got one. Why would you take the one away from him? Because he didn't. He was clueless about how to steward it. He was clueless to do what God was telling him to do. He was so concerned about security that he totally missed freedom and the increase that God wanted to bring to him. Now watch this. Now here's what I like about it. The one, he said, take it away from the one who has one and give it to the one that now has ten. <clears throat> Here's the question. What did the one who now has ten, what did the one do to get the one? Watch this now. And the answer is absolutely nothing. He had stewarded and prepared and God reached down and brought increase to him. He gave him vineyards he hadn't planted and he gave him fields that he hadn't planted. He gave him lands. He brought supernatural increase to him, but God brings that supernatural increase to him when we steward the season we're in and do with what we're supposed to do that God has called us to. That's why we partner together with God when we partner together with God. We do our part. God does his part and supernatural favor is attracted to a spirit of preparation. People come to me all the time. I have this happen in conferences all over the world. They say, Billy, man, how did you get where you're at? I said, well, I want to just, confession's good for the soul. I started out like the person with one talent. No joke. And I had about the same attitude as the person with one talent. Come on, folks. I mean, we value security. And who in the world wants to take risk? In fact, the verse right before that, you know, if we read that verse, it says, take the, verse 28 says, take the one and give it to the one who risks the most. Now, let me say this to you. Don't risk if you hadn't had a season of preparation. But just entering a season of preparation is risk. I'm going to go to Karis Bible College. And I'm going to go, you know, full time, or I know we have the hybrid now, but I'm, I'm going to take that step of faith. I see students every year coming in, every year. And they took, they took a lot of risk to go to school. But let me just tell you this, you take the kind of risk God tells you to take, and you obey God in taking those risks, there's great reward. And that season of preparation will always be rewarded by God. Watch this now, because God is always faithful. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith we cannot please God. What? For he is the rewarder of those who seek him. And God is always a rewarder. Amen. So favor is attracted to a spirit of preparation. I'm going to have to hurry. I have a lot of stories. I can't tell them. I'm going to have to give this to you. Okay. Number two, favor is released through a spirit of association. Let me say this to you. God has people for your life you have never met. And God has people for your life or experiences for your life you've never had. And we're talking about the season of preparation. God has people for your life that you have never met. And God has experiences for your life. I call them Kairos moments. Pastor Mark mentioned uh, being here this weekend was like a Kairos moment. God has Kairos moments for your life that you have never experienced or had. And I like to say it this way, there's a treasure chest. Because God is no respecter of persons. What he'll do for Billy Epperhart or what he'll do for Andrew Womack or what he'll do for Pastor Mark over here, he'll do for you. He's no respecter of persons. And what happens is we're talking about this that favors release through a spirit of association. Anytime I have moved forward in the things that God has declared over my life, it's been because God 
brought somebody in my life to teach me and show me what was next, not only spiritually, but practically and naturally. I call those not just divine appointments, but divine connections. In fact, let me say something to you. Did you know that, this is a proven statistic, that most people in, in America and in Western nations, they make within salary or income or assets that they own, they actually make within 20% of their five closest friends. So if you're around a bunch of broke people, Now, just remember, the Bible says you got to love me to get to heaven. <laughs> Settle down now. It's okay. So I start med messing with your life or meddling with you. It's an absolute true statement if you start looking at it. Now, I'm not telling you you shouldn't have some friends, and I'm not telling you that you shouldn't go get rid of all your friends. That's not what I said. I just said to recognize you got to be careful who you're around and what they're doing to you. I can tell this one's not going over real good. Let me try. I'm going to try this side over here for a minute. See if I, Brad, I got you over here so you can cheerlead me a little bit. And here's what's amazing is God has this treasure chest full of divine connections and Kairos moments and most Christians have never even opened the lid. God said, I have this treasure chest over here because I'm no respecter of persons and I've got people for your life you've never met and I've got experiences for your life you've never had. Divine connections and Kairos moments. Most Christians never, ever open the lid because they never really walk through the seasons of preparation that God has for them. Listen, when this king of Babylon reached down and picked up Joachim and set him above the other kings, that was a divine connection, not just a divine appointment because that divine connection gave him, watch this now, a daily allowance for the rest of his life and let him, watch this, eat at the king's table for the rest of his life. Gave him housing for the rest of his life. Watch this now, put clothes on his back for the rest of his life. And I'm not talking about welfare here because he, watch this now, he prepared for 37 years for that moment of divine connection. So here's what I've learned. So most, some of you who I've never seen you before, today's the first day. You know, I, I teach on business and finance, right? And so that's what I'm doing, a little bit here. And uh, it's really fun to do it when you don't need an offering. that the Holy Spirit will take you and walk you through that where that release comes. And the spirit of association, or in other words, favor comes through divine connections and kairos, God opportune moments. And did you know God's no respecter of persons? And I believe that every believer has a ton of, of God opportune moments that most of us never even recognize because we haven't walked through the spirit of preparation in a way that we should and God is always always moving in our behalf in some way there's opportune moments that come and divine connections and we don't steward those seasons of when they come thank you Billy that was really good Okay, the last one I'm going to give you, and then I'll be done. And uh, let's see what, how much time I got. Oh, man, they said I have two more hours. All right, well. Now, this is one I might go a tad over, but I want to sh share this with you. Favor is revealed when you come into your own land. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 9 Again, in the Message Bible, and I'm not always a fan of the Message Bible, but in this, I'm going to read it because it, it says some things, defines some things. 
In verse 9, Joshua chapter 5 said, God said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. That's why the place is called the Gilgal. It's still called that. That Gilgal means to roll away. And he said here, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt or the mindset of Egypt or the reproach or the shame of Egypt. I have rolled that away today. See, we have to change our mindset to get to God, to get from God what he wants to get to us. Now listen, we've already got it, but our mindset prevents us sometimes from walking in it. Verse 10, the people of Israel continued to camp at the Gilgal. They celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the plains of Jericho. And right away, the day after the Passover, they started eating the produce of that country, unraised bread and roasted grain. Then watch this, verse 12. I have this starred, underlined, tripled in my Bible. It says, and then no more manna, the manna stopped. As soon as they started eating grown food grown in the land, there was no more manna for the people of Israel. That year they ate the crops, they ate from the crops of Canaan. Just say this with me, would you? Just out loud, just say this with me. Say, on that day, the manna stopped. Many Christians today, when it comes to the blessings of God, are still living off the manna. And I can prove this to you in our giving. I can prove this to you in our giving. We give, and then we, we, we look to find money on the ground, or somebody else will come up and give us a $100 bill. And we shout and we praise God because the manna came. You know what the word manna literally means? What it lit that was a honey cracker, but what it literally means is what is it? Manna literally means what is it? They, they had no idea what it was because it was the supernatural provision of God. So let me explain to you this. God will bless you and I. He's no respecter of persons. He will bless us with supernatural provision. But God doesn't expect us to sustain ourselves off of, go from one supernatural provision to another. And some people say, well, why is that? Because you see, instead of me receiving the $100 because I gave 20 or 100, God wants me to give the $100. Instead of receiving the four bags of groceries supernaturally that I didn't see coming, God wants me to get into a place of giving the four bags of groceries. Oh. Oh. So where is the four bags of groceries coming from that I'm given? It's not coming from manna. You know, back in the old days, I'm only 39. But you go back there where I was born, they used to serve babies Blue John. Now we got all these fancy bottles and, you know, I mean, there's every kind of formula you can imagine. But back in those days, right, you had about one choice, maybe two. You didn't like that, tough. That's where you were, right? Well, what happens is a lot of Christians, we walking around with a Blue John bottle in our mouth. And we're calling to blessings of God, and all it is is manna. God wants the manna to cease. Stay with me here. And he wants you eating of the produce from the land he has given you. In other words, the four bags of groceries or the $100 bill or the 100000 is going to come from the land that he's given you that you've had to go and possess and take from the giants and the walled cities. God is wanting you to go into that land and the produce of that land allows you to walk in such a blessing that now I'm not just being blessed. Hallelujah, I'm blessed, but I'm being a blessing to others and I'm not just giving this or giving that. I'm giving large portions to be able to bless what God wants to see in the kingdom because I now have come into my own land. So the real favor of God gets released off of your life because you come into your own land.
Can I say this? I, 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 I don't like telling these kind of stories. I truly don't. I, I honestly don't like to because then it makes it look like I'm pointing at me. You can't look at me. You got to look at God. But I remember because I was a manna eater. And I was so excited. My wife and I were getting ready to have our first child. A lady I'd never seen. Methodist Hospital. Methodist, right? Methodist Hospital in Dallas, Texas. I was in a Lamaze class. Don't ever go to one of those. <laughs> I'm just telling you now, men. The first time that my first child started coming forth, and I saw it, and I was supposed to be telling my wife to breathe, I passed out. <laughs> and the next thing I did was I had smelling salt under my nose. And I was in the waiting room. My poor wife was in there by herself. Don't get me off on that. But a lady, but a lady came up and gave me a hundred dollar bill. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, you might as well have given me a million dollars. Right? A million dollars. You might as well have had because that hundred dollars was worth that to me. It was true manna. I'd been given. I needed the money. We were as broke as you could get. And the hundred dollars was like God telling me, buddy, I'm for you, I'm with you. Now, that's good when you're getting started walking with God. It's okay to eat some manna. But come on, some of you have been walking with the Lord 10 years. Some of you have been working with the Lord 30 years. Some of you have been walking with the Lord 50 years. Now, I'm not saying God can't come up and give you a honey cracker every now and then, but you're not going to live off a honey cracker. You're going to have to go to Cracker Bell, get you some greens, some mashed potatoes and gravy, some chicken fried steak. I mean, you're going to have to get off the manna. You're going to have to get off the honey stuff. Now, you may get a couple of them biscuits and corn rolls in the beginning, put you some honey on them and enjoy it, but that's the appetizer. The real stuff that you need to be eating coming later. And where it's coming from is the land that God brings you into. God is no respecter of persons. If he has a land for me, he has a land for you. So I thought I was doing real good, Rachel. This is a true story. I remember I thought I was doing real good. And uh, so I still had a man of mindset. And then the Lord did some things for me to show me. I started many years ago. This is many, many years ago. The Lord I started showing me, for example, in those days back then, and I still invest today, uh, quite a bit actually, but I, I was buying real estate. I started buying real estate, and I was kind of new. And I'd been into it at, back those many years ago, about two years. And I remember I had purchased a specific piece of real estate for a specific purpose, not just, not just to rent, rent, but I had, pur I had purchased it for a real specific purpose. And I remember purchasing it, and it was kind of a little bit of a risk. I had to put a little bit more with it than I typically would, and it was, it was a pretty good risk. But I felt good about it, so I did it. And uh, I remember selling that property. This is years ago. True story. I remember selling it, Two years later, and I made $160,000. Now, in this day and age, I don't mean this to sound wrong. It may sound wrong to you. I'm not trying to sound wrong. I'm not trying to sound pretentious. But today, $160,000 is not life-changing for me. Okay, I don't want that to sound wrong to you or pretentious, but it's just true. Okay, it's not life-changing money. But in those days, that was life-changing money for me. And I remember writing the tithe and giving the check off of it. And I realized, I think that's the most money I've ever given at one time. Now, one day... Come on, stay. give me a minute. I'm, I'm almost, my watch is ringing. One more story, real quick story. Now listen, I'm not talking to any religious spirits in here. If you're carrying a religious spirit, you're going to get upset at me for talking about this stuff. I'm just telling you now because it bothers you. The minute you start talking about money, it touches the spirit. And I'm not taking up an offering. I'm not going to end this myself. And I, Anyway, I remember the first time I sold a company I had built 
and the cash coming from that company with no debt. I could do anything with the money I wanted. I sold the company for $1,053,000. And I remember getting the check, the cashier's check. Back in those days, you know, you can't just wire it. You don't do, we didn't have ACHs and all that anymore, electronics. I got a paper cashier's check for $1,053,000. I didn't have an iPhone back in those days, so I couldn't take a picture. I had to go find a real 35 millimeter film. And can I tell you something? There's just something about putting a million dollars in the bank that you don't know anything on that just touches you in your soul. You know where it came from? It didn't come from somebody at the hospital coming up and giving me a check. It came from the produce of the land. And the reason we can't get Christians in the body of Christ today to where they need, they're still trying to live off the manna. And God wants you. Now listen, your job today can be part of your land. It's okay. I'm not telling you you have to have a business, but I'm telling you there's other things besides your job God has. He's no respecter of persons. Now I'm not criticizing the job. I think jobs are great. I think if you're going to eat, you got to work. So I just want to be clear about that. But the flip side of that is, God, if you're going to really walk at a level that's life-changing, you have to pray in this 37 years of preparation and say to the Lord, Lord, what is it that I need to be doing in my life? And really who I'm talking about here today, right now, who I'm talking to is a lot. I'm hopefully a lot of young people are listening to what I'm saying. And even the older ones today, think about Colonel Sanders. He didn't even start Kentucky Fried Chicken until he was 64. George, George Washington Carver didn't even discover the peanut and all the uses for it until he was 88. So there is land out there that is for you. Now, I want you to hear me. And I'm, I'm landing the airplane. Minute, eight seconds left on my watch. Here's what I want to tell you. Are you ready? The land which God has for you God will dispossess the land in order for you to go in and possess it. People go, what does that mean? Let me explain it to you scripturally. When the nation of Israel got ready to go into the promised land, Numbers chapter 13 says, this is the land which I give you, right? Right? And they go in, you know the story, they go into the land, walled cities, giants, right? Here, here's what most of you don't know. 150 years in Bible history before the nation of Israel stood on the banks of the river and got ready to cross over into the promised land. Before that time, 150 years before that, Egypt, the nation of Egypt, which was the most prominent nation in that day and age, had armies that were scattered throughout the land of Canaan. Armies were scattered everywhere. In fact, in every main city during that, that period of 150 years was possessed by the Egyptian army. Over a period of 150 years, the pharaohs had started moving those armies out of that promised land. So at the day that the nation of Israel stood on the banks of the Jordan to go over, to go over and take in the promised land, to possess it, that land, the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, which literally means merchant or tradesman, the land of Canaan, Canaan literally means merchant or tradesman. In other words, there's something going on here. And when they walked into that land to go possess those walled cities, there was no real armies there to protect them because God had over 150 years dispossessed the land in order that the nation of Israel could go in and possess it. 
So my question for you is, if God's no respecter of persons, what land has he dispossessed for you in order for you to go in and take it? We quote the scripture that the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for the righteous. Well, if you're going to quote that scripture and believe that scripture, then God has some land somewhere for you. Not that he's hurting anybody for you to get yours, but God will spiritually and naturally dispossess that land so you and I, with the favor of God on our life can go in and possess what has been dispossessed. So this morning I'm going to pray for you. The greatest next steps in our life or the greatest next half step in our life is revelation that the Holy Spirit gives to us. Now, I want you to hear me on this. Stay with me here for just a second. Give me a couple more minutes. It's not just about information. Now, if you know anything about me, you know I'm big on information. You know I'm big on teaching you how to do something. And I believe in that. But no matter how much information you get, you can't go forward with just information. You can only, watch this now, you can only go forth with revelation. Now what that means is this. I can steal somebody's information, but I can never steal their revelation. So whatever the revelation is for you, I don't know what that is. God has revelation for you. And as I've said many times this morning already, God's no respecter of persons. So what happens is there's revelation in your life. Now listen, when you hear a message like this, I certainly, the, the last thing in the world that I want you to do is feel inadequate or guilty. But I do want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to understand that God's no respecter of persons. And I'm not expecting everybody to walk out of here today and, you know, do something overabundantly supernaturally. I mean, Joachim walked out from a service like this and spent 37 years in preparation. But I'll tell you what I am expecting you to do is start looking at God, what God wants you to wants to prepare you for first revelation God gave to me and it's already of course it's already been unfolding now but quite a few years ago when Becky and I shifted into a new season the Lord told me he said you've been handling millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars he said now I'm going to teach you how to hunt how to handle hundred millions and a billion and as I've walked in there I'm already at the hundred millions my next level is billions You say, look, I'm still at the $10 level. I got you. That's where I started. I started at the 50 cent level. So if you ever come hear me speak somewhere, most of the time I'm talking about finance, money, business. That's what the Lord told me to do. Can I talk about other things sometimes? But this is the challenge. This is the anointing. This is the place God's put me. And so that's what I'm sharing with you today. So this morning, I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you corporately. But I want to pray for you that you, you come out of here today with revelation. Now let me tell you about revelation because I'm going to pray for you here in just a couple of seconds. Revelation is not always about do I see the whole picture. Now that's what we think. Oh God, show it to me. It's a grand thing. Well, sometimes the Lord does that. And he'll show you the whole picture. But most of the time, revelation comes. God shows you the next half step or the next full step you need to take. I don't know what that is for you. I have no idea. But the Lord will reveal to you what the next half step or the next step is. When Joachim took the step he first took to put him into that new season, he went into captivity. Now, I'm not telling you today to go put yourself in jail. What I'm saying was he probably had no idea 
that the next season of how God was going to promote him was to bring him through a season that was completely a season of preparation. I do know this, for you to get to your revelation, meaning the manifestation of the revelation, you have to go through seasons of preparation. And I'm going to tell you right now, listen to me, seriously. You give somebody, for example, because I'm a finance guy, you give, you give people a million dollars and they hadn't become a millionaire in their mind, what happens to the money? It's gone. It's called lottery winners. They lose it all. So whatever season you come into, you have to go through a season of preparation. God prepares you in order to do that, whether it's being a missionary, whether it's doing business, watch me now, but even in your family, to be a parent, any season you're coming into, you have to go through it. You just don't show up one day grown up in it. Amen? So I'm going to, my wife's going to come join me. Come join me, honey. Would you stand with me today? And uh, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you that you'll know this morning what the next step, next half step is for you. Because favor, the favor of God is released over your life. God's no respecter of persons. But that real favor is revealed to you in the season you are in when as God shows you the land that he's causing you to step into. Whatever that land is for you, then he causes you to step into that land. Some of you may already be in your land today. And if you are, then you continue to steward that. You walk in that. As you walk in that, then God's blessing and increase will come to you. And so this morning, as I pray for you, and Becky and I pray for you, it's about that next half step, next step of revelation, not information. You may need to get some information, but it's about revelation because the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. So, Father, right now, come on, join me in prayer, and let's agree as a point of contact right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person, every man and woman, every young person that's in here today. I pray even for the, there may be some children, I'm not sure, but I just pray for the children in the back. I pray for the children in the service, for, for every man and woman, every boy and girl that's in here today. And I pray for them today that I speak over their life a spirit of revelation. And I say today that, that that revelation is coming to them in the next step, the next half step they're supposed to take in walking into their land. And Father, we believe today in Jesus' name that you have worked that in the minds and the hearts of your people this morning and we thank you for it in Jesus name and everybody said amen well let's rejoice right now come on let's just rejoice and thank God and thank God for that amen